Are you on the RCR mailing list? Never miss a beat of the news and hard-hitting stories you've come to know and love. Stay in the loop. Visit realitycheck.radio forward slash email. Nathan Smith has been a journalist for NBR and worked for the New Zealand Initiative before being cancelled during the pandemic. He's now a freelance writer and shares with us his experience of cancellation and thoughts on how to change policy agendas and the problems with our media in New Zealand. Nathan joins me now. Welcome to The Crunch, Nathan. Thanks for having me, Cam. So uh, 2020, you had a bit of a bit of a serious year. That was the same year everybody was copping a flogging from the Ardern regime, but uh, in the middle of all that, uh, you got cancelled from your job at the NBR. Tell us a bit about that. It was the initiative at the time, um, down in Wellington. I had moved from the NBR where, where I spent uh, the better part of a decade being mm. a business journalist. Um, the initiative picked me up. And I went there to be the chief editor, which was fun. Really enjoyed those guys. But, so the, the initiative was the replacement for the business roundtable, right? But, it was, yeah. But, but yeah. without the balls. Correct. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's probably a good way to put it. Um, in 2020, while everybody else was stuck at home, um, I suddenly had an email um, asking me for my comments on all these uh, very ad hoc clipped pieces that they're taken from the blog. What was my opinion on this? It turns out the blog was mine. Yeah. I've been um, maintaining it since about 2007. We're talking 15 years of writing, millions mm-hmm. of words. Uh, by the way, the audience on the blog was a piddling maybe six or seven on each post. It was really like an online diary for me. I was just writing opinions and stuff. But M- musing about things. Of and, course, yeah. of course. Hypothesizing, actually, kind of like your articles on the BFD. Correct. Uh, I work for you now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You get all my, all my, all my great writings. Um, so the, like I say, um, the, art, um, the pieces of the articles, millions of words, they had gone through and I don't know how much they read. I wouldn't have wanted to read my entire blog. So I, I, I pity them the job doing that, but they managed to find some, some nasty things they said. Uh, and what was my comment on these? I had no comment because my policy is I don't talk to journalists. There's no good reason ever to talk to a journalist. And that's good advice. That's one I give to politicians when they come at me and say, "I've got, I've got this journalist um, trying to contact me about what about something." I said, well, "So what? Ignore them. Just ignore yeah. them. Don't answer the phone. There's no rule that says you have to answer a journalist's question." And so that's really good advice. Do not speak to journalists because I know the way it goes. Because I was on the other side of the fence for mm. you know my whole career. It's where I cut my teeth. And I know that as soon as you send an email out to somebody or ask them for comment, you've already written the story. You can't change their mind. Yeah, what you're wanting is is instead of the last line saying, we've contacted Nathan Smith for comment, you want the last sign to say, uh, the last you know, paragraph to say, we contacted Nathan Smith for comment, and he said no comment. Yeah. Or- and, and then they've uh, honoured their, you know, their ethos or their, their ethics or whatever it is that, that they've contacted you and given you a fair chance to, right. to, but that's never fair, is it? It's never fair. They already know where they're going. They've already written the story in the way they want, and there's no changing their minds. So really, it was a pedestrian hit piece, but it was against me this time. So I'd never felt that. And the bizarre thing about the position that I was in was that I really didn't have a good philosophy of what my changing role was. It's it, like I said, for ten years I was on the other side of the curtain. I was the journalist. I was the guy that called people for the comment. Mm. Other people were the story, not me. So to suddenly be the story was actually a bit of a shock. I was like, I wasn't quite prepared for that. So thankfully, I had a good philosophy. I play chess, so I, I know sort of how this sort of plays out. Yeah. Um, so I knew what my response would be if should that ever happen, and it did happen. But it was still a little bit like, whoa, I'm the story now. I'm That must mean I'm important because following journalists' own philosophy, they don't punch down, right? <laughs> so they yeah. always they always of course punch they out. don't. Of course they don't. So by their logic, I must have been someone important. And this kind of at the time was was a bit of a bit of a like I say a shock to me. That was probably the most shock. A revelation. Anyway, it, it's the initiative didn't help. Um, I resigned immediately, mainly because I felt that at that point there were about eleven to fifteen other people who were more important than me at that place. And I still like those guys. I still think they do a good work. I didn't want to. I wanted to. The whole point of not talking to journalism uh, at all is to uh, pull the wind out of their sails, to completely yeah. deflate it, to that's end exactly it as quickly right. as possible. I mean, that's right. Every time I get a call from David Fisher, I just don't answer it. Yeah. Right. Every time I get a call from some journalist, unless I know them and I trust them, which 
It, it's a very short list. It can be counted on the fingers of one hand. With fingers left over. With the, yeah, with fingers left over. Uh, I just don't talk to them because they've, they've already written a story. They're just trying to get your comments so they can tick the box for their editor to say, have you contacted Slater? Um, it's bullshit, yeah. right? It, it, it's a game, and I know what that game is because I've played it, and you know that game because you've played it. So I'm already there in my head, um, and the advice I got was, well, are you a cage fighter? And I thought, no, I don't really want to play this out in public. So I resigned and went to go do something else. Uh, you know, I'll get to the blessing in, in a moment. But, you know, the, they did try to pull it out. They did try to push the wind in those sails a little bit more. That I think I actually didn't end up reading any of the articles that they put out after that about me. But they kept trying to do it for that, for that week. In that week, um, we're talking sort of the end of uh, 2020, um, it was, you know, it was me on the news and, you know, one of my cousins, um, you know, said, her, said his wife said, is, Oh, that's not a good thing. Is it when, when she saw my face on say one news or mm. three news yeah. or whatever. And, and, and my cousin said, no, it's probably not a good thing at all, but I was everywhere. And it was one of those weird, you know, almost Truman show moments where you are sort of walking around and you, um, you know, naively think everybody knows who I am. No one knows who you are. In fact, we'll get to this um, later as no well. One knows and no, no one, one cares. reads the media. <laughs> so again, I'm sort of trying to sort of sort of rationalise this in my head. So this was my decision. I did jump ship. I went to go do something else. You know, I was pushed, but I also jumped at the same time. I'm not going to talk about it. So anything that comes is completely my fault from now on. So that's where I sort of moved. Mm. And you know, you were probably one of the first people on that day to actually give me a call and say, "Mate, I know how you feel." And, you know, I've got a lot of time for you. Let's have a talk. Let's keep this conversation going. It's all nonsense. You had your sources telling me sort of what was going on. Mm. And um, that was, it was, really was the end of, of the hit piece. I, I, I made sure it ended. Yeah, because you suffocated the oxygen yeah. from the story by not talking to the media. And this, this, is, this is what I, when people ask me for advice on how to deal with the media, it's, that's the only single piece of advice I give them. There's, Do not speak to them. There's never a good reason. You may think there's a good reason, but let me just remind you that when you're buying ads or marketing or you're engaging with a PR, you know, you, are, you have debt. Mm. When something happens and the journalist calls you up, you have a debt to pay. Mm. And now all that money that you've spent for the good messaging in the media gets reversed and now you have to defend yourself from the bad things. If you had just not gotten involved with the media in the first place, you would have that, you would have no debt. Yeah. And, and this is the thing, it's, it's, a, it's a, always a bad move to get involved with the media. And that's not a nice thing to hear if you're in PR or you're in marketing because that's their livelihood. But anybody who engages with them is, a, is accruing a certain kind of debt and yeah. that has to be paid back. I mean, I, I always say to people, if David Fisher's ringing you, it's not good news, no, yeah. right? I say, but here's the thing, right, is that he always plays both sides of the story, just not in the, not, just not in the time frame that you want it to be. So, and that's the important thing here to, to understand is that news doesn't hap, just happen. There's, it usually comes from a person with an axe to grind who calls a journalist and says, I think this is a story. The journalist agrees with that axe to grind, then decides to construct the story and then go, oh, well, we better get the other side of this to see yep. if there is anything. And they're hoping that you're going to say something so they'll take it out of context and put in. And that's the other thing, always um, do interviews live. That's what yep. I always say. If you have to talk to a journalist, do it live. Yeah, they've got no time to um, edit uh, research, edit. Edit is, a, edit, edit is an insidious thing. But I, but I agree. Look, there, I, I've for a long time thought – there's no such thing as investigative journalism. No, it's axe to grind. There, there is, there, there's always a source, there's always a leak, and there's always an axe to grind. And no, no journalist is going out there, you know, like Tintin trying to find stories. That's just, that doesn't happen. It's, it's, they, they ca sit, it's cartoonish. These claims by the media bosses that we're holding, you know, it's speaking truth to power. Um, you know, we're holding the powerful to account. And every any other sort of bumper sticker slogan that they like to chuck out there, it's all bullshit, right? Yeah. They, they, they're there to fill the gaps between the advertising spaces that they couldn't sell. Mm -hmm. And that's what a story is. It's the gap in between the advertising. Yep. So, I mean, uh, beyond that, uh, as, you, as you introduced me, I am a freelance writer. Um, I, I, I agree with David Graeber. If you can't describe your job in three words, you have a bullshit job. <laughs> and so when people ask me, what do I do? I say, I'm a writer. Yeah. And I'll, I'll always be a writer. I just say editor usually when people yeah. ask me. 
Yeah, look, and it's 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 fun. I'll never not write. I enjoy it. I get better. It's one of those artworks, I suppose, that you get better at as you age. And I think, you know, you can't write and not read, so I read a lot as well. Mm. And that's one of the hardest things in, in, in my life, um, which is why I enjoyed uh, working at the initiative when I did, is because I'm usually the most well-read person in any room, mm. which also ironically makes me the most right-wing person in any room, <laughs> usually, which is why I was attacked. Yeah. But um, Well, one of the reasons they said they were attacking me. But I, it's to be rewarded with the uh, job of writing for someone like me is, is pretty big. So I've, I've still got a handful of places where um, my, my pieces move. I've actually done, you know, as we were just talking before, more investigative work through my freelance world mm. than I have ever did when I was in, 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 in MBR, in the real mainstream media. Um, but I write lots of cool technical stuff. I work for a lot of companies. I've seen some amazing, amazing things. Sometimes I write ads, although back to my philosophy before, it's always nice to be on one side, but not the other side. Yeah. Um, and I just enjoy writing and no one's going to hold me down from doing that. It's what I'm good at. Yeah. I have something to say rather than need to say something. That's, you know, I'm not a social media whore. I don't just jump on social media and put out any opinion I want. Most of it, most of the times it's considered, it's well-researched. I, I, and I have to say it because it's important to say. And I think, I hope my readers enjoy it. Well, that was the problem with COVID, wasn't it? There's that the media uh, acted as censors uh, on behalf of the government and decided what we would talk about, what we would discuss, and what would, would be not discussed at all. And we saw even stuff uh, in recent years has taken an editorial line that the uh, argument over climate change is no longer an argument, that the science is settled, which is a joke when, when you think about it. Uh, and then, therefore, they were no longer going to publish opinion pieces from people who had a contrarian view to their editorial position. And we saw exactly the same thing happen in COVID, which led to the excess. Well, I think it led to the excesses of the Ardern re regime because there weren't people in the media baying at them uh, for these totalitarian excesses. They got away with it, mm. um, and they largely got away with it because they took bribes. Yeah, look, COVID was a strange time. I think what happened happening to me at the same time as COVID and then seeing how it sort of all played out as well with the freedom movement, I think a lot of people can resonate with, with my experience. Mm. Um, there was cancelling at a national scale. Mm. A lot of people lost family members, lost jobs, you know, um, lost businesses, um, marriages, businesses, lots of things. To So there's, I think what I... Although it was directed at me, I was amongst the mass cancelling and the media was behind a lot of that. I do like to sort of think about <sighs> COVID was a, was one out of the box. It won't probably happen again because they no, they'll try. You can't, do two, they'll try. You, can't do, you can't do it the same way twice. But I think it's good to sort of think about it from a different way. If it wasn't a virus that had a 99.999% you know, non-fatality rate, survivability rate, if it was, in other words you know, slightly worse than a cold. If it actually was killing, let's say two, let's say three, three percent, maybe four percent. If you mm. want to bump it up to ten, you can. Let's say if it was really, really bad pandemic, you would actually want the government to act in the way it did. The problem was that it wasn't a virus with that sort of lethality. And the media knew. But if it was a virus with that lethality, as they've shown from research in places like Equatorial Africa and and a lot of Asian places. When you get this, you know, a, a virus is a very serious outbreak, like Ebola or something like mm. that. It doesn't last very long. Well, it doesn't spread because, because it burns itself out. And as soon as you you hear that the next village has got Ebola in in there, then you just shut down your village. You don't let anybody from that village come. You don't let anybody else go anywhere, and it burns itself out because it's so lethal it eventually burns itself out. Well, that's my point. You don't point. need a government to act because yeah, right. common sense kicks in, right? And, th and that yeah. was the approach Sweden took. They said, oh, you know, you don't have to wear a mask. You don't have to have a vaccine. Yeah. Carry on socialising. Uh, if you're sick, stay at home. Mm. Yeah, it was nice to have a, a counterpoint, data point um, of Sweden to show that actually you didn't need to lock down in the way they did. But the only reason I, I sort of frame it in that is is to remind people that actually when big things 
happen that really do threaten civilian lives, you do actually, that's what you pay the government for, right? Mm. The government's sole job, their, their first is core responsibility the is security. And shutting down would have been great if it was a more lethal and more spreadable virus. It wasn't. And I think now we're seeing, as, as a lot of the papers that are coming out afterwards, the media knew at the time, and their censorship actually led to overreach of the state, not just in New Zealand, but in Australia, Canada, most of the Western countries, and I would say developing countries as well. China is a little bit of an outlier because it's a monarchy anyway, so mm. it can do whatever it wants. But in supposed representative democracies, you would have thought that there would be some balance, and but there never was. So we're always told that the fourth estate exists to act as that balance against egregious use of power by politicians. Yeah. And in this instance, we saw in New Zealand in particular that the media largely were all in lockstep. And we saw, I think, what a lot of people are still grappling with, that there is no fourth estate, uh, or at least it's not the fourth, it's the first. The media is the most powerful piece of, I would say, the civil service, because you can mm. actually connect... Because let's just put it this way. If, if, if I wanted to advocate, if I want to set up my own newspaper to advocate for monarchy or a theocracy, could I get state funding to do it? No. No. So I, in other words, as a journalist, as a media entity, should I set one up, it must follow the state's message. So now who's in control of the state's message, me or the state? It's the journalist. Mm. So when, and, and again, in a representative democracy, the control of people's minds through propaganda and information, if you want to call it that, decides votes. So if you are in control of people's minds, you decide the country's direction. Mm. So in my mind, the logic where that plays out is the fourth estate is actually the most powerful estate. And we saw that, I think, during, the, during COVID, during every election, but definitely during COVID. They decided the direction of the country. Not only was Bloomfield running the country for almost three years, mm. he was getting his marching orders. He had to be deferential to the media. He still had to turn up to the press conferences. Yep. He still had to tell everybody what he was doing. The media could have cancelled him or could have put a bullhorn in his mouth. Either way, they, they control the direction of New Zealand. And that's still, by the way, going on. That hasn't changed since no. COVID. It's just gotten more entrenched. Yeah, that's what people say to me. Oh, you know, if only um, uh, Winston Peters had not chosen Jacinda Ardern um, for the government, we would have had a national-led government in the pandemic. And I said, well, just hold on a minute there, right? I said, you're presuming that they would have done anything different. All right, so firstly... Winston Peters didn't choose Jacinda Ardern. Bill English failed to negotiate, right? So he was tits at negotiating, and he ended up in opposition. Yeah. And then he subsequently quit. But if he'd been the Prime Minister when the pandemic came, where would he have got his advice from? Well, he would have got it from Ashley Bloomfield. He would have got it from Tony Blakely. Yeah. He would have got it from all of the same people, you know, the, the, the pink-haired walrus from Auckland University. Would have got all those same people would have been providing information to the Prime Minister and he would have done exactly the same thing because people um, misunderstand that that politicians are smart and then they're not. They're just not smart, no. right? So they rely on experts and so it's the experts that drive everything and the politicians make the decision on what they're going to accept but they only get one, usually one set of of, of experts. Well, the way I think about it is who has more power, the person that writes the speeches or the person that reads the speeches? Yeah. It's always it's been that way by the way since ancient Greece. Well, but you know this, right? When you when you were being a, when you were a journalist at NBR or even at the New Zealand Initiative, you would have received press releases from all the politicians. And and when you see the avalanche of press releases that come in and it literally is an avalanche. Uh, you, you you have a look at them. And they've, 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 they follow a standard format, right? The government is announcing such and such and such. The eminent, amazing minister says this, right? Um, and then there's a quote and then there's another policy thing and the minister adds, da, da, da. The minister didn't say those things, right? They, he, did, he didn't come up with those words. Probably wasn't even the same room. Probably not. All he did is put his initial on the, on the press release, say, yep, I'm okay with that, that goes out. It was written by some functionary in his office and th these words and quotes appear in news articles, you know, such and such said this, this minister said that. They never said it at all. But those, they have to own those words because it's come out of their office. Mm. But it literally is a factory of producing soundbite quotes that can be used in news articles 
And often when you get the press release and then you look at the subsequent news article, you find it's almost verbatim. Yep. Almost verbatim. But that, the, the, the news article has, you know, David Fisher's byline on it or some other person's byline on it as if they wrote the press release. Yeah, the, the civil service operates on process, whereas a king or a prime minister you would expect would run on executive decision. Mm. Um, there is no decision-making process in the process of the civil service. Everything goes to either goes sideways or up to your manager. You don't do anything based on your own initiative. It's just the way it goes. Mm. And while that's fine, um, you can think of the civil service as a giant super tanker um, floating down the, uh, the ocean. You know, when, when the information came out during COVID that it clearly wasn't as scary as everyone thought it was, that maybe we took a little bit of a panic decision here. Um, the, the process was already in place to lock down, to shut New Zealand's borders, to make sure everybody wore masks. The civil service was already gearing up. It's really hard to turn a super tanker when it's traveling at full speed. When it, real super tankers can take kilometers to change course. Mm. So as a metaphor, it, does, it, it, it would actually take two to three years for the civil service to get out of its own crazy pattern of thinking and change direction for how we approach COVID. So everything that I see that happened from 2020 onwards, uh, not only just to me, although everybody else can sort of resonate with this, wasn't necessarily down to decisions being made at an executive level across the civil service. Mm. It's just following process. And everybody knows that the Ministry of Health was where you go if you're a civil servant, if you are a loser and you can't do anything else. Yeah. Before COVID, it was where it was where everyone was kicked sideways until they couldn't fall off the paper anymore. Mm. That was the Ministry of Health. Even John Key used to talk about it with, you know, sideways glances. Everybody knew it was it was where the retards were, excuse my language. But it was clearly shown during COVID because they had no clue what to do. But when the process got going, they were even more incompetent because they couldn't even follow their own but, damn but processes. But there's no geniuses in the civil service. You there's, don't there's, go into the civil service if you're smart. Or, or, you do not. or ambitious. You don't. Right. Maybe in Singapore you do because they actually fund you to go to places like Oxbridge or yeah. any of the Ivies and stuff to come back so that you are the best to run their country. But it's a city state. In New Zealand, you go to the civil service if you, are, if you have nothing to do and you cannot make it in private industry. That's just the way that goes. And you like living in Wellington. It's full of midwits. And, you know, Wellington, no one likes living in Wellington. If they say they do, they always claim uh, that it's great on a good day. But that's all they can say about it. And I'm being slightly facetious, but, boy, the wind gets into your soul down there. But I, I, w I would say It's a that, lazy wind, too. It just goes straight through you. And I, it, the civil service is, is really, like I say, it's responsible for a lot more than I think normal Kiwis give it credence for. I think a lot of Kiwis did see the size of the state during COVID. You know, some of them felt it in their lives mm. you know, painfully. And it deserves a better kind of person. And I think if you are interested in New Zealand's direction in the future, you should think about encouraging your kids to band together with friends and take collective jobs in certain civil services and increase the competency. Learn better and try and f give back to you. You don't have to join the army to give back to the society that gave mm. birth to you. Mm. You can go into the civil service. That's why they call it a service. And it needs higher quality people because right now it's full of leftists who have a single direction. There's no one to challenge them because prime ministers cannot hire or fire civil servants. They're completely outside that scope of their executive. And they can basically do whatever they want. And when ACT comes in and decides it wants to cut budget and cut the size of the civil servants, ACT is not going to be there for more than a couple of years. Those civil servants That's will be patient, in career. They? They've got 40-year careers. They yeah. can wait. They'll just move sideways. They'll just be quiet for a couple of years. But the money will continue to flow. This is, by the way, baked in. This is not something we can oh, change. Yeah. So if that's the case, the only thing you can really do if you care for New Zealand's future is encourage better people to be part of the civil service. So that's what I'm encouraging, essentially. Yeah, see, I get asked, you know, Cam, why don't you become a, a politician? And I think I'd rather poke pins in my eyes. Because you get there, I, I, every politician I've ever met, and I've met hundreds of them, right, they all tell me they're going to Wellington, they're going to change things, that it's going to be better because they're there. And it never is. Yeah, they get there and the system starts to grind them. Oh, no, no, you can't do that. This is how we operate Parliament. And all of a sudden, within within a week or two, 
they're becoming institutionalized yep. into the system. That charismatic little politician is now just a lapdog. Yeah. And uh, they get down there and then they find that the system just grinds them to a halt. And if you are a smarter than the average bear, and, and I can probably count maybe five uh, MPs that I've met over the years that would I'd consider to be smart, the system gets them too because we can't have someone like Morris Williamson who's got a Master of Science, uh, understands what radio frequencies are about and all of those things as the Minister of Broadcasting and Communications. Shit, we need to get rid of this guy because he knows more than we do and he's um, undermining our progress in this particular initiative or whatever because he's asking questions that we don't want to answer. Well, the kryptonite for civil service, as I mentioned, is executive decision. Mm. They work on process. And that's why they, and the process, part of the process is you get rid of anybody who decides to work on executive process. Uh, executive, they will get rid of Morris Williamson's. They, well, they will do. get rid of smart people yeah. because it doesn't fit the game. And if you don't know how to play the game, you're up. Uh, fine. But like I said, this is all baked in. So it's not going to change. Like you or I down there who, we make our own rules for what the game is. And we're not playing the game. We don't like your game. We're not playing your game. Take your ball and go do something else. Go and do that's, something else. That's if you don't like. See, and that's what happens in the United States, isn't it? When you get a change of government in the United States, you get a new president. All of the department heads, all the Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of Defence, Sec, all of those jobs that make up the cabinet are not made up from MPs. They're made up from the people the president trusts. Political appointees. Uh, political appointees. And then they say to the minions underneath them, this is the policy now, fit in or F off, and it works. And there is wholesale sackings every time there's a change of government in the United States, usually every eight years, right, but sometimes every four years. Yep. And they sack the people that they believe are going to inhibit their policy agenda and what they're going to do. And we don't have that here. We change our government and the same, the people who were advising James Shaw uh, eight months ago are now advising the National Climate Change Minister. It's the same people in the office. Mm. And so we don't change those people. They never and, change. And, the, and that's what I always say to politicians when you get in there, don't hire anybody who worked in the office before you. Right? At get a minimum. new people. Yeah. Right? Get people that you trust. Mm. But, oh, no, they don't. They go, they go and hire journalists who then jump the fence Right, and there's a whole swathe of them now that are sitting there in in ministerial offices. Oh yeah, uh, you know, writing press releases and doing all of the, those sorts of things. Advise senior press secretary, fancy titles. Well, I mean, one of the one of the things I saw from behind the curtain as well, working at the think tank, was there's a reason why the media encourage encourages Kiwis to play the political game mm. um, rather than the policy game. Because the political game, it's easier to cover. There's two sides. Mm -hmm. A third side, New Zealand, even New Zealand under MMP has struggled in the media to actually portray the idea of three sides because it's, you know, that's, well, for some still, reason that blows journalists' minds. There still is two sides though. You've got, you've got the heads, which is national, and on the other side of the coin is tails, which is labour. Which is actually a civil service. Right, which is actually the civil service. But it's the same coin. It is the same. Like they're, coin. They're, dif they're different sides, but it's the same coin. The media. And so when you transfer, when you go from from red to blue and blue and blue back to red, same coin. It's the same coin. Yeah. Right. And and the only governments that make changes are those that are dependent for votes on stroppy third parties. But the third parties usually don't last more than a term. But it's a, such a waste of energy because I like a lot of a lot of the Kiwis I saw during the freedom movement, and you know I'm. I'm one of them, I would proudly say. Uh, they're, they're your core Kiwis, real heartland Kiwis. Yeah. The, the guys that actually matter for New Zealand's future. Um, they, they got, it was very easy to tie them up to play the politics game because that's where all the energy should go according to the state and according to the media. The system. When I the was, system. It is the system. But when I was, so what I saw was how easy it was to actually play the policy game and that easiness of getting involved in submissions, of uh, sending emails to your MP, of, again, encouraging your kids to get involved in, in, in the civil service. All servants. the sorts of things that Voices for Freedom did very, very, very well. Very well. And it actually, it doesn't take a lot of money because all you need to do is have somebody sitting, hitting, 
F5 refresh on the keyboard to find out when submissions are ready to go. And you need to have an argument and you need to submit it. And the, the ship of state, to use my metaphor earlier, will move because they're bound to the representation aspect of, of, of democracy. When you put your energy into policy rather than politics, you can do huge things. And sometimes it's actually easier to do bigger things than it is to do smaller things, to, to change massive pieces of the state rather than incrementally do it, playing in the courts or playing with politics and stuff. You know, this guy gets in, this guy gets out. We move slightly more to the right, we move slightly more to the left. The oscillation of that Overton window sort of thing mm. is a fool's errand because you're not even controlling it, where it the window It basically doesn't is. change though. I mean, it, it never changes. It sort of shrinks and contracts a little bit, you know, yeah. like a shimmer. And it almost. inexorably moves left because that's what the civil service is. Yes. It's easier for the civil service to control the state under, again, a processed um, decision making rather than executive so that's where it goes by the way process is socialism so of course it goes that way so if you don't want to get involved in that and I and you don't want to waste your energy if you actually believe in the future of New Zealand I encourage people to get involved in policy yeah, because it's, that's it's, very important that's the same advice that I give to people too they say oh, I want the, the government to do this said, but what problem are you solving yeah right, you need to give the minister a reason to act and they're not super smart, these people. So you actually also have to give them the answer that they can choose to act using your answer. And that's where that policy argument comes into because you've analysed the policy, you see where the gap is that needs to be addressed. You go to the minister, you say, there's a gap here. Look at it. Look at that gap. Oh, it's huge. People are falling through that. You need to stop that. Oh, and by the way, here's the policy that will help you do that. And here's 15,000 other people who agree with me yeah. and see the same gap. And if you do that, they'll do it because mm -hmm. it's easier. It's easier than them saying, oh, that's a big gap. I'll get some advice on that. As yeah, soon as they yeah. say, I'm going to get some advice on that, you're stuffed. Yeah. You, you've now no longer got any influence. It's the people giving the advice to the minister that have the influence. Look, having, having sounded so dark on civil service, um, it's only that way because people don't get involved. Really, the civil service is actually there to build, maintain and strengthen New Zealand. And they are looking for problems to solve. Mm. You know, they're, they are a bit like self licking ice cream cone. Of course, th that they will find problems to solve Hell, and then they will make more problems with their solutions. They'll create problems for oh, them to solve. <laughs> but they aren't actually sitting around going, how do we hurt Kiwis? Mm. How do we uh, block our ears to Kiwis problems? I mean, they're they very, are looking. They're very earnest, right? You need to tell them, though. That's the thing. Yeah. They're very earnest. Like, a classic example of, of that sort of policy making, that they, they want to help Kiwis, is the healthy homes policy that Grant Robertson adopted, right, said that this is going to be great for tenants, right, because you can now have a healthy home to live in, right? It's going to be warm. It's going to be dry. And they came up with this amazing policy that was going to cost landlords something like five or $6,000, right? And then Grant Robertson said the next most, perhaps the most stupid thing I ever heard come out of his mouth is, oh, we've, we, know, we don't think that the landlords will pass that cost on that they'll just absorb that and... and <laughs> right. Anybody who's ever worn a suit would see immediately the fault in that. Yeah, like, like seriously, like that was never going to work. And also the, the boffins in Wellington, the civil servants, come up with a solution that almost entirely ignores the human condition, right? A, a, another classic example, I, I took a, and he picked an EP up from the airport once and was driving him to a function and he said to me, Cam, why are all these um, utes driving around in Auckland? Why do you have so many utes? I said, because you guys made it worthwhile to drive a ute. What? He really genuinely didn't know why people drove utes. And so I had to tell him. I said, you made utes exempt from fringe benefit tax because they're trade vehicles and they're always a trade vehicle. If you, ever, if you want to tow the Mrs. Horse float or your jet skis – or the boat, or, or do anything uh, with a car, and it's a company car, you've got to pay fringe benefits tax mm -hmm. on it for that. Uh, or you've got to have the back seat bolted down and a cage put in it, and now your car's impractical. But you don't have to do that with a ute. So and you don't have to pay fringe benefit yep. tax as well. And they just was like, it was, they were just flummoxed. It was like a revelation to them that the unintended consequence of doing that is more utes were on the road in Auckland. 
Yeah. You and gave them the incentive. Incentives and unintended consequences are, these are very simple aspects of economics and anybody can learn them. But, you know, part of, part of my, my thesis obviously has to be that Kiwis, normal Kiwis, not just get involved in policy, but actually try and understand some of these basics and ways to think, how to think rather than what to think. But also how to manipulate the yeah. civil service because of their processes, understand their processes. Well, they're there and for then you. And use them to manipulate to get the result that you want. And you, the thing is, is a lot of Kiwis think it's so far beyond them. A little old me can't get involved in that, but you can. You can. You don't just have to leave it to companies, by the way, who are spending like almost nothing on lobbying government to do what they want. Mm. You know, you would think with the, with, the, the con- with the consequences of changing a policy that the price of doing such would be astronomically high, right? Mm. You know, if you could actually change policies to make New Zealand go in a different direction, the cost of entry into that should be really high. It's really not. It's 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 less than what you might spend might spend to set up your own company to buy a new fleet of trucks. Like any small company or mid-sized company can get involved in policy construction for almost nothing. Only the big guys are doing it because they don't want you to know that. And the media doesn't want you to think about that because they realise how easy it is to actually change the direction of the ship of state. They'd rather keep you involved in politics, but it's actually really and cheap. This, and this is a good point because we've just seen the government announce their, uh, what do they call it, their uh, Fair Digital News Bargaining Bill, which was a Labour Party initiative and National has stupidly decided that they're going to move forward with this. Willie Jackson's ecstatic. And in the news media are ecstatic because, yay, we're going to get one over the big tech. Well, these people are not are not living in our world. Right? It's a very Pollyannish idea that they can pass legislation that will make Google and X and Facebook sit down with the New Zealand Herald and decide to pay them fair uh, amounts for their copy. Now, it hasn't worked anywhere in the world. It's like socialism, right? It's never worked anywhere in the world, but countries still try socialism because they just point out, well, you know, it would have worked in Venezuela, but Chavez, you know, he did it wrong. It would have worked in X, Y, Z, but they did it wrong. So we're we're not going to make those same mistakes. It's going to work this time. Well, a fair digital bargaining bill has been in place in Canada for a number of years. And what did the social media companies do? Change the algorithm, switch them off. Switched them off. Yeah. In Australia, they did the same thing, switched it off. And that's what will happen. If I was advising Google and, or Facebook or X uh, on how to deal with this legislation in New Zealand, it would be very simple. Our numbers of social media users are rounding figures for their company, right? 100%. They don't care. Oh, yeah. They just don't care. So what they'll do is they will just switch off the, the sharing of that news. They'll just switch it off. If you're a user in New Zealand, you'll now no longer get those in your feeds. Yep. They don't care. It's a rounding figure. They won't even sniff. They won't even notice. But the population, and this is where this policy argument comes to, the population will be outraged, the politicians will bear the brunt of it, and that bill will be dropped within a week if they did that. Right. And I'd pick, they are going to do that. Yeah, there'll be pushback. I mean, on, on the bill itself, I think there is... There's just a fundamental misunderstanding of where we are um, in 2024. Um, Not only can Kiwis route around any rules you have and get their information from anywhere on the internet, that's how the internet works, how it was set up. A lot of Kiwis, I think, and again, I go back to the freedom community, not not only are we more sceptical of the media, I actually know a lot of people who simply have stopped consuming it at all, Kiwi news. Like, what really do you need? If you live in Auckland, do you really need to know about a crime that happened in Waikato? No. Four days ago. Four days ago. It's the thing, right? The news that's on 6 o'clock news is catering to an audience that, that resembles in demographic the voters of New Zealand first. And it's habit. Yeah. Most people aren't watching the news to be genuinely informed because they can do that better elsewhere. They're watching it because it's six o'clock and that's what you do at six o'clock while yeah. you're cooking the potatoes. Yeah. Well, it's going to take half an hour for the potatoes to boil. We may as well watch the news. It takes six weeks, according to psychological research, uh, to make a habit and it takes six weeks to break one. Most people were under lockdown for longer than that. Mm. A lot of them have lost their habit. And I know a lot of people who have simply out of vitriol stopped watching media. And their lives are not only more positive, 
they are now consuming things that they actually want to. So, like I say, the internet is a global media database, well, essentially. But let's just touch on that, on, on what's happened to Joe Biden after his debate, right? The, the American public for the last six years has been told that Joe Biden's sharp as a tack. Sure. Right? He, he's, he's clever. He commands uh, in any meeting that he's in. There's a, there's a video on YouTube that just cracks me up. It just... You, when you actually get all of the strap lines that the media have used to promote Joe Biden over the last few years and produce a 15-second clip with their news item that shows them sharp as a tack, right? Most people who are consuming news that way think that he's sharp as a tack. Mm. Well, on, on Friday, uh, New Zealand time, they, they got 90 minutes live streamed everywhere that showed Joe Biden is his dementia. Yep. That he's not sharp as a tack. In fact, he's he's as as dull as the dullest thing you can come up with, right? And he's out to lunch. Yeah. And the media are in a blind panic, watching them somersault and and perform trapeze acts. Very cute. Yeah. Uh, because the gig, the gig's up. Yeah. Their massaging of the view of Joe Biden was destroyed in about 10 minutes, the first 10 minutes of that debate. And the genie's out of the bottle. And now pub, now the public are angry. They are seething because they're saying to the media and to the Democrats, you gaslit us. You gaslit us that this guy was sharp as a tack. And once, once you realise that the media are bent – and you realise that everything you know has come from them, then you realise that everything you know may not actually be true, which means maybe Donald Trump isn't the Antichrist or a devil. I'll now look at this with open eyes. And the gig's up. The, the only counterpoint I would have to that is one thing I do know about the public is that they do whatever you tell them to do. The, oh, we saw that in COVID. Didn't yeah, we? There, there's there's no real situation where the the sheeple will wake up. Um, one of the big reasons is because but you don't need them the to all struggle. wake up. You just need a certain percentage to wake up. Yeah, and you need those certain percentage to be active. They need yeah. to be actually players rather than fools. Yeah, you can't have and I you know and understand where I'm coming from for this, but you can't just go down in your trucks to Wellington and book a few tent spots on the lawn. That's not being a player. That's being a fool. And I've written about this. Mm. You played right into the media's hands who wanted to show that there were some nasty people in New Zealand who were anti-COVID, who were anti-Jacinda, who were anti-everything good in this world. It didn't matter democracy. what the truth was, that there were it genuine it Kiwis there. And, 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 and they didn't, it didn't matter. Yeah. And I, look, I appreciate the charisma and the initiative. Mm. All of that stuff is fine. It's what you want in soldiers. Actually, you don't want initiative in soldiers, and that's my point, is that you, you want somebody who knows what they're doing, who can channel that energy into actual effective changes, and be, that you want players. You want to be able to – people like yourself who know where the pieces of the puzzle are actually supposed to be and how the machine works – but you want to be, those people were desperate for change, as a lot of Americans are. Right. They see the problem here. But what they are going to be led into is one more trap by the media where they all have to turn up on the voting day and get out their anger by ticking, probably with a, some fierceness in their pen, the box of Donald Trump. And then they will think they have been successfully gotten rid of the problem. No, no, you're being a fool. You actually need to spend all your time. So when you spend your, all of your energy on one day, Every four years in America, every three years in New Zealand, you spend you you gather it all, all your hatred and all your energy goes into the election day. Mm. You must understand that your enemy, the the process driven socialists, the people who are taking the civil country, service, the civil service, the are media. working every day. Their energy is being deployed on really effective things all of those three years. Mm. 365, 24-7. Uh, we, we can see You that. need to do that, but you need that. to be following somebody. You, somebody needs to be saying, I have a direction that I want to take New Zealand. And then you, as, as the Kiwi people who want to go in that direction, need to then do what he says. You need to follow him. You need to learn how to be followers rather, because you're not a leader. 
little miss somebody from Waikato. You're not. I know you're angry at the government for doing what they did, but you're not a leader. You are more likely to be a follower, but you do need somebody who, who has who the charisma guide. who can do that. And it's, it's probably not going to be a politician. And if it was, it would be somebody who knows how to cut the Gordian knot. I'm not saying violence. I'm saying get through the civil service to how it needs to be. And that person's job is to do that. You need to learn how to be a follower because you, you can, we cannot afford anymore. The hour is getting pretty late. We cannot afford to have more foolish people going off on errands, wasting their energy on, on enterprises that won't change anything, which is what we're about to see in November in America. And we just saw, I mean, what have you got we, from we, Luxon? But we, really? but we saw that in the last election. We had a, a, a so-called freedom movement. It's all kind of like, you know, the gay community. It, it, it's not actually a community. It's not actually a movement. A right? loose network a lo- of, of, of people, people. Who, who agree on certain things. But when, it, when push came to shove, right, uh, you had Matt King set up his own party. You had um, Liz Gunn, uh, bless her, um, set up her party thing, you know, and was so delusional that she thought that they were going to get, you know, like um, a million votes, right? She actually said that, right? They're going to get a million votes. That's ambitious, right? At Matt King, who said to me on on this show, uh, "Look, you know, I don't believe your poll, uh, Cam. I the, the people who are meeting in the street are saying, yeah, Matt, we're going to vote for you.' He came fourth in our poll. He came fourth in in a poll that he um, paid for himself. He came fourth in a, in a poll the mainstream media paid for three polls. I think there might have been four polls actually in Northland. Matt King was fourth in every single one of them." Yeah, amazingly, he came fourth and he was gobsmacked. Um, but you had these earnest people with a good idea mm. who thought that the way to make that work was to join the system that they hated. Yeah, to give energy to the thing they despise. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then when they failed, it was everybody else's fault. Yeah, you know, oh, it was a conspiracy. It was this, it was that. No, you didn't have a good idea. And, 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 like, literally the worst thing you can do, we've seen this before, right? We've seen wealthy people try to start political parties. We saw Colin Craig try to start a political party. He nearly got there, 4%, but he spent a lot of money. The ACT Party has spent millions of dollars and 30 years later... Maybe passed one major bill. They've got eight MPs. Yeah. Right? And the National Party, which their colours should be beige not blue, right, they just keep grinding on. The Labour Party keeps grinding on. They haven't got any new ideas. I mean, honestly, look at the, look at the politicians. Hmm. What's Christopher Luxon's claim to fame? That he was um, a chief executive of three companies that had monopolies. <laughs> you know, come on. Yeah, look, the, going back to my point, what, you know, what could you do? What, what actually, where could you spend this well, energy on yourself? i tell you what yourself? they can do is they can... Um, smash that donate button for, for for Reality Check Radio because we're the only media organisation that's having discussions like this. So the more you support us, the more discussions like this that we can have that we can shift that Overton window to something that's more appropriate. You know, we, you know, through uh, Reality Check Radio, we've lobbied seriously lobbied to get uh, the changes to the inquiry. That's right. a success. That wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for us. Um, we've had other policy successes, and we've got a whole list of things that we're going to be opposing as well, this climate change nonsense, digital currencies, all you know, government-ordered digital currencies. Good to hear. You know, um, uh, you know, facial recognition and digital IDs and all of that. So we're against all of that, right? And we're going to do what the New Zealand Herald and stuff do on their little hobby horses, but these are far more fundamental things that we're going to do. So what can little people do? You you kept saying little people can support the leaders, the people with the mouthpieces that have got the audience that can shift that Overton window to something that's more acceptable to New Zealand society. I read a book um, last year. um, I can't remember the author's name, um, but it was – it was about a, a Presbyterian minister who got caught up uh, prior to World War II. He was, he was a British Presbyterian minister. Uh, he got caught up before World War II in becoming a communist, and he was subversive. He had his own uh, – well, he was part of a um, um, an underground media organization. He was the editor. He, that's how far he got. 
One of the points he made, which I thought was quite interesting, because he eventually came back around and saw the error of his ways, but I was interested in his journey. And one of the points that he made was, you really can't say you support something or you have supporters if your supporters aren't willing to melt down their wedding rings and send in the gold, which is what the underground communists mm. were doing, you know, the part of the unions, you yeah. know, the, the working class people who had nothing, they were melting down their w- wedding rings just to support this newspaper. And I thought, that's a really good measurement. And I'm, not, I'm not talking about skin in the game. I'm not, not talking about like, put your money where your mouth is. That's loyalty. Something that's really precious to you, which is bigger than you, and mm. you feel you should support it. There really shouldn't be anything stopping you, nothing in your way, no barriers to get there. And by the way, I'm not just talking about money. Let's say you're, you're, one of your kids is really smart. Well, put him up for mayor. Yeah, or or, or, or get him to or, or be, get them to write an the, algorithm that's going to join the police yeah. and become the police chief. Do you know anything that you can vote in locally that gets real change? Like, look at Mayor Brown in in Auckland. Like, mm. he's still being puppet stringed by a lot of the people in Wellington because he doesn't have a huge amount of power mm. because he doesn't have the huge amount of support in, in Auckland. Do you understand? Yeah, yeah. It comes from support. And when you have the ability to vote someone in and then support them locally, they have an inordinate amount of power. And I mean, you need to learn how to be a follower so that you can find the right leaders. Mm. And I think a lot of Kiwis take individualism way too seriously. They don't understand that you need to be a good soldier. You need to learn how to do that. And we, we are, we're too narcissistic, too selfish, whatever. We all want to be the leader. We all want to be the guy that everyone well, shares. We believe the but egalitarian ethos of New Zealand that Jack's as good as his master, but that's not, that's not that, true. That's not how to win. But that's not true. It's either. not true. And it's also a message that your enemies would tell you if they wanted you to lose, right? Mm. Okay, and they know that, by the way. Again, if you're not willing to melt down your wedding ring and send it into the, to the communist newspaper, you can't call yourself loyal and you can't really call yourself decided on the position that you want to, to take yeah. the country. You obviously don't, don't want it if you're not doing everything to get it there. And I'm not talking about being frivolous. I'm talking about being strategic. Yeah. And I think that's the really big lesson of COVID. It's my lesson of, of the cancellation, if you want to call it that way, is that you have to have a plan before you go into something and you have to know what you do when something hits and then you have to be loyal. And you, by the way, I know all, who all my enemies are now, which is great. The great unveiling, you could say. A lot of people feel that way about COVID as well. Not just enemies, but they don't. No, they at them. least know who, who their friends are. We got yeah. to see them. And that, to me, is a blessing because you, you will probably never get a chance like that in the rest of your life to really get that filter going and to know who will stand with you and who will turn on you, probably send the feds around to your house when, when you're not wearing a mask, to know that it was some of the people closest to you who didn't have the attitude that you thought they would was shocking to a lot of people. Well, that's, but what a blessing. I mean, that's what Jordan Peterson said. You know, I mean, it's probably fitting to, to end the interview with a sort of a quote from Jordan Peterson. He said during COVID, everyone th- you know, would say, oh, no, if you asked them about you know, Anne Frank or Oscar Shinley, oh, yes, I would have been like that. Right. I, I'd be like that person. I would have protected Anne Frank. I would have hidden it. But COVID showed us that actually they would have been snitches. They would have been the person who dobbed in Anne Frank. They would have been the person who dobbed in Oscar Schindler. They would have been the person who condemned thousands of Jews to, to death in, in the camps mm-hmm. because COVID showed us that's what people do. And Jacinda Ardern implored everybody to snitch, didn't she? Yeah, and we would – it, it behooves us to remember all those lessons. Everybody, the system is trying to rob you of your memory. It's trying to even gaslight you into, into misremembering what you know yeah. actually happened. Remember those years because you'll probably never get another chance to see that filter again and build on it. Build on it. Don't, don't forget it and allow good voices and good energy just to be pushed back into politics where it's just going to get soaked up and people you don't like um, are going to be in control, using your energy against you again. And that includes other media. Right? They're, they're part of that system that wants to gaslight you. Yeah. And they're still doing it. You support the things you love, put it that way. Yeah. And on that note, Nathan, thank you for coming on The Crunch. Thanks for having me. What a fascinating discussion. You can see now why Nathan writes for me. He is perhaps one of the biggest thinkers currently writing about politics and culture in New Zealand. He's one of us too, and now you can understand his thinking as well. What do you think? Email inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. 
Thank you for tuning in to RCR Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to, just like what you're listening to. Either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you. So connect with us today.